so that means I think we can officially begin. So we will start at 9.30 every week. I'll just start talking at 9.30, welcoming people, uh, meeting new people maybe, doing in-house business like I said, and then I will pray for us. Then we'll uh, shoot to start about 9.45, 9.47 each week with the actual lesson. Today maybe we'll get started a little, getting started a little later, just because it's our first week. If you saw the email, the, this class that we're offering for the next 12 lessons, I call it Theological Systems, which really doesn't tell you a whole lot. And the reason I chose that is because I took a class in college at the Master's College slash University back in the 1980s, and it was called Theological Systems. And it was very helpful. And so that's the pattern that I'm following. And what it is is each Sunday will be one individual, independent lesson on a, a theological Christian approach to Scripture, basically. And we'll examine that, the highlights of it. We'll try to be as objective and fair as possible. Uh, in some examples might be one week we'll look at covenant theology, another week we'll look at dispensational theology, learn how to spell it. Yeah, primo. Um, we'll look at Pentecostal theology slash charismatic theology one Sunday. Uh, and there are many more. So I came up with about 12 of them. And we'll explain what they are, how they influence the evangelical world, how maybe many of those or some of those systems of approaching the Bible have influenced your thinking. And all of those uh, paradigms or theological systems have one thing in common, that is that they have a distinct approach to how they read the Bible, study the Bible, interpret the Bible. And maybe you've been influenced by one of those approaches. Maybe one of those approaches is your preferred approach to Scripture. Maybe you're not even aware of how you were influenced by some of these theological paradigms by which to view Scripture. Uh, so we'll talk more about that. If that's confusing and you quite don't uh, know what I'm talking about, that's fine. I think it's going to make sense along the way. Uh, before we get into these different theological systems by which Christians view the Bible and study the Bible, I've got some questions for you because I want this to be participatory and a little bit of discussion so that we can learn together by way of introduction. Uh, first thing I want you to do is, if you have something to write on, like a piece of paper or your computer or whatever, uh, I want you to write down a definition. You can't look this up on the internet while you're sitting there. This has to be your own work. You can't ask a neighbor. You can't phone a friend. If you don't know, that's okay. Uh, maybe just give it your best guess and come up with something. And, so, and it has to be one sentence or less. So I don't want a long, laborious, detailed definition, but just your, your best shot. Preferably on a loose leaf piece of paper that I can actually collect. You don't need to put your name on it. Remain anonymous. That's probably preferred because after I read it publicly, you won't want your name attached to it and make fun of the definition. But so I, I want to get a definition from you and some input. Okay, so. Here are the questions that I want you to put on that little piece of paper. Question number one is, what is your hermeneutic? That's your personal hermeneutic. Hermeneutic, how do you spell that? Uh, wow, hermeneutic, H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C. What is your personal hermeneutic? You might be thinking, what's a hermeneutic? Gazoon tight, God bless you. Um, a hermeneutic is, well, I can't, it's a way of uh, interpreting the Bible, basically. So what is your personal hermeneutic of approaching the Bible? That's the first answer you want to give, just a little bullet point. My hermeneutic is, and then you write it down. If you don't know, that's fine. If you think you know, go ahead and write it down. Next question, question number two. Give me a one sentence, less, one sentence or less definition of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is, and then go ahead and define it. So what is your personal hermeneutic? Question one. Question number two. Hermeneutics is. That's your definition. Go ahead and write it down. Give it your best shot. Have fun with this. Uh, number three. Give a definition of exegesis. Exegesis. Exegesis is. Again, one sentence or less. That's it. Those are the three things that I want to get from you to get us started. Okay. So what's your personal hermeneutic? Give me a definition of hermeneutics in a sentence or less. Give me a definition of exegesis in a sentence or less. When you're done, go ahead and hold that up. 
and we'll just collect those. Like I said, you don't need to have your name on there. Or we'll just peruse some of those real quick just to get a gist of, we're doing a little diagnosis, a little diagnostic quiz. It's called diagnosing what we do know, what we don't know, or what the perspectives are out there, because that helps us as we begin the topic at hand. And while you're wrapping up your definitions, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us this morning, okay? So let's pray and commit our day to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for this new day, the gift of life, the opportunity to gather with the saints at the local church, the church, the body of Christ, your precious bride. Thank you for every person that you've brought here this morning. Father, now with your Holy Spirit, give us soft and tender and teachable hearts. Uh, we want to be disciples. We want to be followers and learners of you, of the Lord Jesus, of your word, of your truth, of your Holy Spirit. Mold us accordingly and also give us a tenderness towards you that we might submit to the truth of Scripture so that we might please you and glorify you in all that we do. And we commit this time to you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, here we go. So if you got that done, go ahead and raise your uh, piece of paper up in the air. Good. Chi Lam, can you go around and collect uh, whatever you can? So as soon as we get 10 of those, go ahead and bring those up and we'll start reading just for kicks. There's one in the back. Raise your uh, piece of paper up in the air if you've finished your definition, your proposed definitions. And we'll talk about those. Then as we go through uh, the outline today, in 50 minutes or less, this is going to be a jet tour. At seminary, at Bible colleges, they spend like anywhere from 15 to 18 weeks on a class called hermeneutics. So like at seminary where I teach, we could spend 15, uh, 11 weeks on hermeneutics, two hours each class. So we are not going to do that today. We're doing it in 50 minutes or less. So this is a survey. This is an overview. Uh, just to kind of give us a taste of what this topic is all about. It's vitally important, absolutely foundational. As we go through the, how many points do I have here? 12, 18, 19, 20 points I want to make. I want input from you and help from you, and I need scripture readers along the way as we go. Some of the scriptures we will stop and read. Some we just give the reference, and you can look those up on your own a little later. Uh, we are, I am open to questions and discussion as we go. Chi Lam, there's another one back there. Uh, so if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. And then if they get too complicated, or uh, we can defer that to later and, and talk about it, and we'll just keep moving along in the class or table it for later for a longer discussion at another time so that we can get through the material. But I do want you to be interacting and contributing. Looking forward to that, what you have to share. Okay, let's start and look at what you had to say about definitions regarding hermeneutics. And I'll just read some of these. Hermeneutics. Or first, the first question is, uh, what is your hermeneutic? Let's see if anybody was brave enough to actually answer that. My hermeneutical approach is contextual study. Contextual study. That sounds like something technical. That almost sounds, that sounds like they knew what they were talking about. My hermit, they're proud of it, they're confident. My hermeneutical approach is contextual study. I would love to talk to that person later and ask them, what does that mean? What is your definition? How does that work? What does it look like? Um, okay, moving along. How about uh, another brave person? What is your hermeneutical approach? Their hermeneutical approach is the Bible will speak for itself. How can you argue with that? The Bible will speak for itself. Next person, what is your personal uh, hermeneutic? Defer to literal reading of the Bible, except pulling your eye out. Remember when Jesus said if it causes you to sin, pluck your eye out? So I'm going to be literal, except when it says pluck your eye out, because that really hurts, and I don't want to do that. What's my personal hermeneutic? They said literal, face, value, contextual. Now, that's the second time we've heard the word contextual. Whatever that means. This person said, read the Bible in context. Pray. Got some prayer in there. Good. Oh, look at this. This person, whoever it is, said their hermeneutical approach is historical grammatical. That is a technical, formal approach to hermeneutics. 
we'll do a couple more here. Personal hermeneutic. Go to the Word in prayer and read surrounding verses for background and context. So they're describing how they study the Bible. Oh, look at this one. My hermeneutic is systematic theology. This is quite controversial. This is going to be a fun class. Okay. Well, we'll stop there with my hermeneutic. Study. Oh, my hermeneutic is study methods, and my hermeneutic is read the word. Different translations. Okay, so uh, maybe I didn't clarify enough because some people are describing how they study the Bible. When actually what I was asking is, what is your hermeneutic? What is your school of interpretation, uh, technically and formally speaking? What is the title of your approach to Scripture? Because if you're a Christian, you should have a hermeneutic. And it should be formal. It should be defined. You should know what it is. You should be consistent with its use. What is your, it's kind of like asking somebody, what's your blood type? Victor, do you know your blood type? Yes, you do? Okay. That, that's rare. I don't know what mine is. Good job. A lot of people are typical like me. They don't know their blood type. Uh, But you have a blood type, whether you realize it or not. You have a blood type, whether you agree with it or not, or whether you like it or not, or whether you know it or not. You have a blood type. And if you're a Christian, you have a hermeneutic, whether you realize it or not, or know it or not. So one of the benefits, hopefully, of today and also this class for the next 11 weeks or so, is you're going to actually figure out what your hermeneutic is. Uh, And you may be surprised. Um, Also, it's actually knowing your blood type or finding out what your blood type is is a little more, that's not the greatest analogy because your blood type usually is an objective, definitive, unchanging answer that you can find empirically. So it's actually defining your hermeneutic and identifying your hermeneutic is more like what is your ethnicity? What is your complete total ethnicity broken down in percentages? Now most people don't know that. And then they'll spend 35 bucks to some company to look up your your genealogy with a drop of blood and your ethnicity. And then I'm 32% Irish, 47% German, uh, 3% this, 7% that, or whatever. Most people don't know the breakdown. So your hermeneutic actually is more like your ethnicity because it's many variables and factors involved. You typically don't know what it is. You don't know what the breakdown is or the influence of each one. Uh, really, it's a hodgepodge. Most people's ethnicity, if you go into history, it's a hodgepodge. And that's true of most Christians' hermeneutic. They, what's your hermeneutic? Well, I really don't know. What are you talking about? Why, why are you asking me that question? Oh, well, I think it's this. No, that's not a hermeneutic. That's a description of how you study the Bible. What's your formal hermeneutic? Oh, I guess I don't know. Well, let's discover it. Let me ask you some probing questions, and then you discover and you realize, wow, my hermeneutic as a Christian is a hodgepodge. It's a, it's a mongrel. That's what it is. It's a combination of all kinds of different influences, and I wasn't even aware of it. So I'm uh, assuming or predicting that many of you, if not most of you, have kind of a hodgepodge of a hermeneutic. Not a bad thing. And you haven't quite really defined it before. Some of you have because I read one, grammatical historical hermeneutic. That's what I was looking for. Uh, There's about three or four specific categories of a hermeneutic. That was one of them. But most of us, typically, your average Christian in the evangelical world has a hodgepodge of a hermeneutic, and you're gleaning principles of how to interpret the Bible from all kinds of different influences throughout your whole life, depending upon your background, your education, your favorite preachers, uh, your Bible translation, what you do and don't know about theology, and on and on it goes. Uh, So that's what we're going to discover this morning. Okay, definition of hermeneutics. I'll just read a couple of them, and then I'll give you a technical definition Hopefully that's simple of hermeneutics. Let's see what we got here. Definition of hermeneutics. Somebody said the interpretation of the Bible. Study methods. Sorry, that was their definition, not their approach. So that's study methods was their definition. Hermeneutics is a way of understanding. A way of understanding. Let's think about that. A way of understanding is kind of dependent upon the reader then, right? It's more personal and subjective. A way of, is that hermeneutics? That's what we got to talk about. Another definition of hermeneutics, um, how to study the Bible. How to study the Bible. Oh, there's a theme here. The method of reading Scripture. A way of reading the Bible. 
the approach taken to interpret the Bible, how to interpret Scripture, how you mine the Scripture for meaning, the interpretation of the Bible. Okay, these are all thematically related. They're not technically totally wrong. They are kind of a popular understanding of hermeneutics, so that's not surprising. They're not consistent and they're not technical airtight definitions of hermeneutics. So let's do that first. So let's go to the handout. And this is going to kind of lay the foundation of what we're talking about today with hermeneutics. A technical definition of hermeneutics. It's real simple, actually. It's, and you were intersecting with this truth. The rules of interpretation. That's it. The rules of interpretation. You might want to underline rules. What are the rules by which you abide by as you read your Bible, study your Bible, interpret your Bible? The rules are hermeneutics. Now, the rules have nothing to do with me, the participant. It's kind of like in a basketball game, you've got rules. Okay, we're going to play basketball. Here are the rules. Here's the rule book. They are printed. They are fixed. They're objective. They don't change. You must abide by them. They have nothing to do with you, the player. You don't contribute to the rules. You don't change the rules. You may try to argue about the rules. I'll give you a technical if I'm a referee. But you don't change the rules. The referee has nothing to do with influencing the rules. So hermeneutics are the rules of interpretation. Very important. Short, concise, crisp. What about exegesis? Definition of exegesis. I'm just going to move on with the technical definition of that. Very simple as well. What is exegesis? Exegesis is applying the rules. Applying the rules. Applying the rules of hermeneutics, that is. That is the process of exegesis. So that's where some of you were talking about how you interpret the Bible. How you go about interpreting the Bible is more exegesis than it is hermeneutics. So some of your definitions were kind of, you were mixing hermeneutics up with, with exegesis, which is common, it's understandable, but you've got to keep them distinct. Hermeneutics is, these are the rules by which you interpret the Bible. Exegesis is applying those rules. Uh, exegesis is kind of, actually hermeneutics is kind of the handles by which you guide exegesis, the process. So exegesis is the process. Hermeneutics are the objective rules by which you do that. You can do it different ways. You can do it the right way. You can do it the wrong way. And just by the way, in, in the evangelical world, the Christian world, all of these terms that I'm giving you are, are disputed. People wrangle about them. Theological controversies about them. Doesn't mean that we can't know a, a standard objective definition. These are the traditional, I think, accurate understandings of proper definitions of hermeneutics and exegesis. So we're, that's how we're going to proceed. Those are our presuppositions of what we're going to talk about for the rest of this lesson on hermeneutics. We're going to assume that hermeneutics can, is the rules of interpretation, that exegesis is applying the rules of interpretation, and we don't deviate from those rules. I can't make up my own rules. I'm not going to say, what is this? The worst thing you can do in a Bible study that we do all the time, you've got 12 people and you're in a circle, you read a passage, you go around, okay, everybody tell me what this verse means to you. And you get 11 different interpretations of that verse, and maybe, maybe, maybe not, they actually represent what's actually true about that passage. That's not abiding by the rules. What is that? That's a, pers that's a subjective approach. And you want to avoid a subjective approach when you're doing hermeneutics and exegesis. Our approach to exegesis, studying the Bible, should be fixed, objective, unchanging, with a standard, applying the rules to the best of our ability. And it has nothing to do with me, my opinion, the conditions of society, historical tradition, what the church says, what your church says, what your feelings are, what your preferences are. It has nothing to do with it. Oh, wait a minute, Ephesians 5 says, wives, submit to your husbands. Even worse is 1 Peter 3 that says, wives are to obey their husbands. Boy, that, that makes some women upset. Oh, I don't like that. That doesn't sound good. I don't want to do that. That can't possibly be what it means. Let's change that. Let's water it down. Let's massage it a little bit. Let's fix that. It can't literally mean obey or submit. Really? Do we have the freedom to do that? Change the meaning of a 
the Bible. So that's how hermeneutics and exegesis plays into our own personal biblical interpretation. Okay, so let's go from there. So when we get, to, so what the goal is here is to get to the actual principles of hermeneutics, which is down at the bottom of the page, one through twelve. So hopefully those are principles that you can adapt, use, apply, add to your arsenal of Bible interpretation. That's probably what you were thinking when you're thinking hermeneutics. Oh, it's how you interpret the Bible. It's the process of studying and interpreting the Bible. So those twelve principles, hopefully, you can add and prioritize and do them in the right order and then do away with that which isn't legitimate. Probably the most invasive, illegitimate tendency in hermeneutics and exegesis today in your average person and an average Christian just because of who we are and also uh, the influence of other variables is when it comes to hermeneutics and exegesis, uh, there is a push to add subjectivity to the process. And we can't do that. That's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid the subjectivity. And remain, the goal is to remain objective by objective standards. And these principles, 1 through 12, will help us in interpreting the Bible properly. And I, I need to emphasize how important hermeneutics is, the rules by which you approach the Bible and study the Bible. Actually, hermeneutics is the heart of every theological controversy, I think, just about, especially among Christians. Whether it's the charismatic issue. Anybody here got a charismatic background? Pentecostal background? I do. That's why I'm raising my both hands. So I understand what that means. And there are many controversies. Uh, you, can you be a charismatic, a Pentecostal, and a true born-again Christian? Yes. And can you have a legitimate debate over a theological matter with somebody who's a Christian but not a charismatic Pentecostal person? Yes. And no matter what the issue might be, whether it's speaking in tongues, being filled with the Spirit, being slain in the Spirit, ongoing revelation of their prophets today, all of that stuff, bottom line, you're going to be arguing over probably theology. You might be poking out and pulling out some verses in the Bible, but in the end, in my opinion, it comes down to your hermeneutic. What is your approach to Scripture? What is your approach to that verse? How are you understanding, applying, and interpreting that verse? Where'd you get the rules by which you determine that meaning of that verse? Is that really what that verse means and intends? So it comes down to hermeneutics, and that's on almost any given theological issue between Christians. That's why hermeneutics is so important. So you got to get, are we even operating on the same plane, the same field with the same rules? Because if you're not, uh, one person is on AM frequency, the other is on FM frequency, and you are just passing each other. And you're not going to really have a fruitful dialogue or conversation. So that's why this is so foundational and important. Hermeneutics, knowing what it is. Also, definitions are vitally important. That's why I started off with definitions. Anything in the theological, Christian world, biblical world uh, that brings up questions or debate and dialogue, especially between professing believers, you've got to start by having common, understood definitions that you can agree upon. Otherwise, you cannot have a conversation. So if we're going to talk about hermeneutics, we've got to agree on the definition. If we're going to talk about exegesis, we've got to agree on those basic fundamental definitions. So before we get to our principles that we want to implement and apply to our own life and in our own Bible study, by the way, this isn't just theory we're talking about today. This isn't just academic or academia. I might be using some academic terms. They are important. But my goal here is very practical. My goal is to get you to be considering these 12 principles of hermeneutics of how you study the Bible, from your own private devotions to any opportunity you might have for you or parents teaching your children the Bible. Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher, a women's Bible study, men's Bible study, Sunday school teacher, whatever it is, a Christian school teacher, an evangelist on the street corner. These will apply to you and how you teach the Bible faithfully in a way that pleases God. That is the goal. But before we get to the 12 principles, we've got to talk about presuppositions. Anybody here got a good definition of a, what a presupposition is? Because that's a big philosophical term with a lot of syllables. Anybody got a short? There we go. Joe, lay it on me. Presupposition. Foundational. <clears throat> that is an excellent. I couldn't even do better than that. Joe, thank you. Foundational assumption, is that what you said? <clears throat> yeah, it's like a settled conviction, a foundational assumption by which you operate. Uh, you don't question it. This is uh, the pillars on which you stand by which you're going to view everything else. Presuppositions. Presuppositions are like your, the glasses that you have on either consciously or unconsciously. Okay, everybody go like this. 
Everybody go, everybody, you have to or else you're not going to pass the class. And to the best, so these are your glasses. These are your presuppositional glasses. They have lenses. The lenses have, a, have various colors. Maybe they're yellow, purple, blue. Now you've got to put your glasses on. And whether you realize it or not, you always have your presuppositional glasses on when it comes to the Bible, and you have presuppositions. There are things that you just usually unconsciously assume to be true. And you're going to approach the Bible that way. Again, let me give you some examples. Uh, Joe, can you think of an example regarding the Bible of a major presupposition? Maybe one that you have. What is a major presupposition, settled conviction uh, that you have maybe about the Bible? Okay, so Joe's, one of his presuppositions about the Bible is that it is reliable. He can have confidence when he goes to it to read it. That's, that is an example of a presupposition. There are others who their presupposition is, and they call themselves Christians. They go to seminary, they graduate from seminary, they become pastors even. And one of their presuppositions is, well, the Bible does have some errors in it. Nevertheless, it is God's Word, it is authoritative, but occasionally you've got some errors in it. That would be true of some of the professors I had at a Christian college where I studied in Santa Barbara, California for the first two years of my college career. And these men were all professing Christians, Christian scholars, but just about every one of them in the Bible or Religious Studies Department, one of their presuppositions is the Bible is God's Word, the Bible is authoritative, but the Bible does have a few errors here and there because it was written by men. So, and you just have to be discerning and just spot the error, get rid of it, you're good. You can believe the rest of it. For example, Jesus made an error. Did you know that? that that's what I was taught at this school. Jesus said the smallest seed was the mustard seed. Psh, everybody knows the smallest seed in the world is not the mustard seed. There you go. Even Jesus made a mistake. So just as long as you're up to speed and you, you can discern where the errors are, just get rid of those and you're going to be fine. So that's a presupposition that a lot of Christians have. Uh, a lot of Christians, probably a huge, I don't know, it might even be the majority of Christians today, one of their presuppositions is that uh, secular, atheistic, humanistic geology and the scientists in that field are the standard of truth when it comes to the origins of the universe or, or cosmologists. So we have to, that's a presupposition, so we need to bow the knee to whatever they say and they say everybody knows it's a scientific, uh, scientific established fact that the universe is 13.5 billion years old. That's a presupposition. You can't change that. So now when you study your Bible, you have to put those lenses on when you read Genesis and just kind of tweak and totally reinterpret Genesis 1 through 3. Can't take it literally. God didn't create the world in six days. That's just poetry. That's not literal. And that affects your hermeneutic. But that's based on a presupposition. My presupposition would be, mm, no, we don't know for a fact, scientifically, objectively, empirically speaking, that the universe is 13.5 billion years old. Nobody was there around. It can't be verified. It can't be tested. There's no constant there in a scientific lab to establish that as true. I mean, there's all kinds of scientific reasons why it's not true or can't be established as hard, cold fact. It is a theory. Wait, it's the evolution theory. That's what it's called. Uh, so my pre presupposition would be, no, the Bible is reliable at face value. Uh, Genesis 1 to 3 is history. So that's my presupposition. Okay, so very important. Presuppositions. Let's zip through these presuppositions that I think you need to have and they are biblically informed. If these aren't your presuppositions, consider studying the Scripture that maybe they should be implemented into your worldview and become a part of your presuppositions when it comes to studying the Bible as a Christian. I am assuming that you are a Christian as we're going through this. Somebody, somebody today, you might not be a Christian, that's all right. But the conclusions that I'm making are assuming that you are a Christian, you are sincere, you want to study the Bible, you want to have a biblical hermeneutic, you want to understand God's word the way that he gave it and intended. So identify and assimilate these presuppositions. Number one, uh, truth can be known with certainty. If somebody can look up for, uh, John, actually 1 John 5.13, when you get it, raise your hand. Read that nice and loud in just a second. And then if somebody can look up Psalm 19, and then someone else, uh, Colossians 1.28. And when I get to those, I'll ask you to read Colossians 1.28. Uh, John 8, 32, I'll just say what that one is. 
and we'll look at a couple other scriptures. But truth, presupposition, truth can be known with certainty is the key word. That's the underlying word, certainty. The reason I put certainty as the underlying word is because I want to be emphatic about that. As a Christian, according to the Bible, you can know truth with certainty. Not just a great high degree of probability, but certainty. This is totally disputed in the world today in which we live, even in academic circles among Christians and evangelicals. I've met plenty of Christians who were Christians, born again, true believers, who told me to my face point blank that, Pastor Cliff, we can't be certain about anything. I mean, we can't be absolutely certain about anything. I'm like, what? Let's think about that. Let's start, let's look and see what Jesus said or Paul or the scriptures. Can we be certain about anything? Well, we can't be certain about anything. Absolutely, in an absolute sense, because, for example, there are things that we can't see and haven't experienced. You can't be certain absolutely, scientifically, empirically about what happens after death, like that there's a heaven and hell, because nobody's been there and you're not able to observe it empirically. So you can't have an understanding of the true nature of heaven and hell with certainty, and that would be an example that they give. Um, so they're maybe using a scientific definition. And I would say, no, I think Scripture makes it clear that as a Christian, there are certain things that you can know with absolute certainty and total confidence. So John the Apostle, these things I have written to you, I am writing Scripture to you, says John the Apostle. First John. To you who? To Christians, fellow Christians. I am writing scripture to you. The purpose, for what? So that you may, with great high level of probability, know that Jesus is the Lord. No. The word she read was, I am writing to you this truth in scripture so that you may know. That is certainty. That's certitude. With confidence. There is a condition, by the way, to have this certainty about spiritual truths that she read in there, and that was the word believe. I am writing these things to those of you who believe. If you don't believe, if you do doubt, if you doubt God, you doubt Jesus, you doubt his word, you doubt the truth, yeah, you're not going to have certainty. So the condition is belief. Belief in what God said, belief in his truth. If you do, scripture guarantees that you will have certainty. Thank you for reading that passage. Uh, and there are many more. Uh, truth can be known with certainty. That's the promise of scripture. Uh, contrary to what the postmodern world in which we live today says, postmodernism. I don't know if you know what that word means. It's been thrown around for the last 25 years. It comes out of actually academic circles and literary scholars. Then it trickled over into theology, and then it trickled down into our modern culture. And the idea of postmodernism is that you can't really know anything with certainty. Ultimately, there's really only relative truth. Not so, says the Bible. Number two, after truth can be known with certainty, uh, number two is that God has revealed himself. God has taken the initiative to reveal himself. God had to, by virtue of the fact that human beings were created finite in the first place. Adam and Eve were created finite. They weren't omniscient. They didn't know everything. Can you imagine that first day God made Adam and Eve, and they're standing there, and they don't, they don't know anything. They're only a day old. They're seeing stuff they've never seen before in their life. Everything in their life had to be divinely interpreted at that point. Therefore, God had to give revelation. He had to initiate it. By the way, your name is Adam. What's a name? Well, that's what I call you. Well, who are you? Well, I'm God. I made you. So God had to initiate giving truth, giving revelation, by which human beings could understand reality. But, and God has done that. God has revealed himself. Romans chapter 1 makes it clear. Not one person on planet Earth is, has a legitimate excuse to say, well, I don't know, I'm an agnostic, I don't know God, I don't know reality, I don't know truth. God says through Paul, no, that's a lie. Every person knows because God has revealed himself through revelation. Romans 1.18 and following. He's real, revealed himself primarily in two ways, through creation, that's general revelation, through creation, through the conscience, and then divinely through Scripture. So God has revealed himself, that's clear. And he's done it, he's revealed truth about himself objectively. The most objective form of revelation that God has given is, say a prophet spoke something that was written down and inscripturated in the Bible. It's here, it's propositional, you can read it and reread it and pass it on and this is objective truth. In sentences it can be examined, it can be scrutinized, meditated upon. It's either true or not true. 
propositional truth. God has given that to us. And then the incarnate Jesus himself is the highest form of revelation of God. When Jesus invaded this world as the God-man. So God has revealed himself. He has revealed truth. He's done it objectively. He's done it propositionally through propositional truth, the writing of the scriptures. So truth can be known with certitude. So if you're a Christian today and you have doubts, doubting is normal, but God's promises you can have certainty. And the only way you're going to get certainty is by going to the Word. Immersing yourself in scripture with the help and the aid of the Holy Spirit, that's the only place that you can get certainty. Anytime we sin, that undermines our certainty. So we've got to confess to God and ask for forgiveness to get back on track. When we are in His will, being obedient, reading His Word, understanding it, following the lead of the Holy Spirit, you're in a prime position to have certainty in your life. And for all of us, that fluctuates. Up and down. It's a roller coaster. Number three, presupposition. God has revealed Himself sufficiently. So we can know truth with certainty. God has revealed Himself. God hasn't revealed everything about Himself. But God has revealed everything we need to know about himself. The truth we have about God is not exhaustive. The truth we have about God is sufficient. Very important. Sufficiently. This is called, the, when it comes to the Bible, this is called the, sufficient, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. I have everything I need right here that God wants me to know. There is no more to know about God outside of the Bible that God wants me and expects me to know and holds me accountable to know, at least in this lifetime. When I go to heaven, I will learn more about God, but right now I have everything I need to know. Scripture is sufficient. I don't need to be looking for a prophet with new truth. The Bible's sufficient. If there is a prophet out there, a person who says, I'm a prophet, thus saith the Lord, and they, they give revelation, very simple. Okay, what's your word from the Lord? Well, here it is, thus saith the Lord, and they make a statement. Think one of two things. Is that statement consistent with Scripture? In other words, is it already in the Bible? If it is, then it's superfluous. We don't need it. You didn't make that up. You stole that out of the Bible. Or the second alternative is, they say, thus saith the Lord, and it's not in the Bible. It contradicts the Bible. And it's like, uh-oh. That is not truth. That is false prophecy. So the Bible is Sufficient. An example I put there, somebody got Colossians 1.28. So this is the Apostle Paul talking about his mission as a pastor and preacher and an apostle. He's preaching gospel truth. That's selective information, limited information. It's not exhaustive information of everything that God knows. It's a finite message of truth. I, I preach truth, I preach the gospel with the goal that Sinners or people might become, come to know Christ and then be complete in Christ. So complete, you can be complete, adequate, thoroughly furnished just from the limited amount of information that God has revealed to us through the Bible. So it's not exhaustive information. It is sufficient information. There's enough in here to make me complete before God as a Christian, Colossians 1.28. There's enough in here sufficiently to get me eternally saved. That's what Jesus said, John 5.24. He who hears my word and believes has eternal life. That is sufficiency. That's everything. Eternal life is first and foremost having a personal relationship with the Father in heaven. That's eternal life. Knowing the God of the universe, being in His family, knowing Him intimately and personally. No one can interfere with that relationship. That is sufficiency. Number four, believers can understand the Bible. Uh, John 8, 32, Jesus said, Know the truth, which assumes you can know the truth. He didn't say have a high level of probability up to 99.9%. .9%. Now it's know the truth. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So believers can understand the Bible. Jesus said that over and over again. That's why one of... Jesus had a couple of favorite phrases when he taught, and one of them was, uh, this one was kind of a rebuke. He'd say, have you not read? That was usually a rebuke. You knucklehead, you Jewish knucklehead, you grew up in the synagogue, you studied the Old Testament Scriptures your whole life, 
It's plain as the nose on your face. Have you not read? Hello? That's what he was saying. It's in the Bible. Another one of his favorite phrases when he was teaching is, it is written. It is written. That's actually one word in the Greek text. It stands written. It stands written. It is written. That, that was his authority. Scripture is true. Scripture is reliable. Scripture can be known and understood. Scripture can be applied in your life. We are accountable to the truth of Scripture. Believers can understand the Bible. That's a promise from God. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Paul is talking to Timothy and reminding him, Oh, by the way, I know you're half Gentile, but you're also half Jewish. One of your parents didn't teach you the Old Testament Scriptures. One of your parents did, and your grandma did, raised you in the Hebrew Scriptures about the true Yahweh. You know that, Timothy. Remember that? The Scriptures you were raised with? The Scriptures that you know and came to learn that gave you eternal life? So he tells, he tells Timothy, point blank, you know the Scriptures. You can know God's truth. So believers can understand the Bible. Emphasis there on believers, unbelievers. Can unbelievers understand the Bible? Any thoughts? Comments? Yes, no? Okay, I heard a no. Anybody, yes? Can, under, uh, can unbelievers understand the Bible? g -Lam, yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, so if somebody said yes, somebody said no, Houston, we have a problem. We have Christian division. Can unbelievers understand the Bible? g -Lam, you said yes? Okay, uh, what do you mean? How, why are you saying that believer, unbelievers can understand the Bible? Partially, okay, they, partially and superficially? Cerebrally. Cerebrally? Spiritually. And spiritually? Is there any legitimate understanding they can have of Scripture, unbelievers? That, that's true and actually reflects what's being taught in the Bible, unbelievers? That's a yes or no question. Are there believers who can read the Bible and on face value, understand what it is actually saying without confusion. I'm going to say yes, because I did that when I wasn't a Christian. The guy, one of my friends was witnessing to me for two and a half years, and he kept reading the Bible to me. I knew what he was saying was true. This is about Jesus, this is about hell, this is about your sin. And he'd ask me, do you believe what I'm telling you? Yes. Do you believe Jesus is God, like the Bible says? Yes. Do you believe there's a heaven? Yes. Do you believe there's a hell? Yes. Do you believe Jesus is the only way to heaven? Yes. Do you believe that if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll go to hell? Yes. Do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior? No. That's what I did for two and a half years. I knew the Bible was true. I didn't understand all of it, especially in a way that a Christian can. You were saying you were <clears throat> I was an unbeliever at the time when someone was witnessing to me for two years from basic Bible truths about who Jesus was, that He was God, He's the judge, I'm accountable to Him. Death is coming. I was made by a Creator. I have sin. I knew all these things to be true. <clears throat> I understood. My, well, my point is, as an unbeliever, I understood it. But I was resisting the truth. I knew the truth. I was resisting it. That's Paul in Romans 1, where he says, unbelievers, they know, it's the word he uses, they know, the, but they resist it. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. What does that mean? Well, they're standing on a big box. The box has a lid. Inside the box is God and truth, and the unbeliever standing on the lid of the box and jumping up and down, trying to keep God and the truth from coming out, and they know it's in there. That's called suppressing the truth. So, but believers can understand Scripture in a way that unbelievers cannot. So unbelievers do have a limited kind of understanding, and there are some things they simply can't understand. That's clear. That's 1 Corinthians 2. So that was not a yes and no question, that was a trick question. So the person that said no and the person that said yes, you are both correct. I'm just trying to bring pre, uh, peace among Christians. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, number five, we are limited. As Christians, we can understand the Bible, but we are limited. Why? Because we are finite and we're also fallen. So we do have the doctrine of clarity of Scripture. That means uh, Scripture, we can understand it, or it's called the perspicuity of Scripture. God gave Scripture with the intention that we could understand it. He doesn't want to confuse His people. The Bible's written in the language of the people, kind of newspaper language. But at the same time, we are limited. There are things we can't understand in Scripture. That's why Ephesians 4 says God gave a gift to the church. One of the gifts that God gave to the church, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, is teachers to the church. We've had 2,000 years of wonderful, blessed Bible teachers as a gift from God, and they, they are not to be eschewed or pushed away 
or forgotten or minimized or insulted, saying, well, they were from 1,200 years ago. What do they know? No, they were gifts from God. Even commentaries, good commentaries of godly men, those are gifts to the church that we need to be blessed by. What they have studied, what they have anguished through and learned and prayed and what God has showed them to illuminate and lighten Scripture for us. Teachers, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 and other places. And because we need teachers because we're limited. None of us have arrived. Uh, number six, God has given uh, the church teachers. So that was my next point, number six. God has given the church teachers. So embrace that truth. Don't look down your nose at those who have come before us, which C.S. Lewis called historical snobbery. When we, the present view, people of the past as dumber than we are, less sophisticated than we are, less educated than we are. It's actually probably just the opposite. They were not distracted by electronic devices. The Puritans, they just had, okay, what do I do today? I only have 12 hours. I guess I'll study the Bible again. Okay, those are presuppositions. Let's go on to the principles of hermeneutics that hopefully you can apply even starting today if you haven't already, and you will find fruitfulness in your own Bible study preparation and even teaching and application in your own life. Principles of hermeneutics, uh, th these are the uh, rules by which we should abide by as we study the Bible. Number one, as a Christian, we should pray. If you're a Christian, pray. Pray of dependence. God, help me understand your word. So this, I, on here I put Psalm 119. It's got a zillion verses in it. I only put three as an example, verse 25 through 27. And here's the psalmist, whoever wrote Psalm 119, was a believer, loved God, loved God's word, recognized that he was a sinner, realized that he was finite and limited, and he needed God's help and God's spirit to understand Scripture. And he believed he could. But he pleads here with God, Yahweh, be my teacher. Open my eyes. Help me understand your word and your truth. That's called illumination. We need to depend upon God. So that's rule number one. We cannot depend upon our own strength in anything in the Christian life. Continually ask God for His help through prayer. And for us today, it's primarily asking God to help us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. And Scripture calls the Holy Spirit who lives in you your teacher, your helper, your comforter. Really, He is the master teacher. And he will help us understand. It's not guaranteed that you'll always understand everything the right way the first time exhaustively. But generally speaking, God will answer that prayer and help us grow in our understanding. So rule number one, pray as you seek to study the scripture. Number two, before you study the Bible, you've got to get the right translation of the Bible. If you don't, you can get into some serious problems. If you're a King James only person, there's some good stuff in the King James that came from 1611, but times have changed, languages have changed. The King James guys, as they translated from Hebrew and Greek, they made some mistakes. They were influenced by their times. I think it's Genesis 4.21 that talks about the music guy, Tubal, or whatever his name was, who invented the organ. It is laughable. He did not invent the organ. That should not be in uh, the Bible, organ. That's a bad translation. That isn't what the Hebrew word means. Um, so that's just one example out of King James. Uh, New America, uh, the NIV. Uh, the NIV isn't all bad, by the way. There's some great Hebrew scholars that worked on the NIV, particularly in the Old Testament. I know some of them personally. But there are some places where it was botched, and it was a committee of scholars. And some of the interpretations were based on their presuppositions or their theological propensities, and that's where some of the verses they messed up. The classic one is 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and following, in the original NIV. And that's just a bad translation. Where basically, if you read it, it's kind of like, uh, it is good not to get married. Whoa. When it's actually, literally in the Greek text, it's good not to touch a woman. And many English translations translate it the proper way. So you've got to get the right translation. It is good not to touch a woman. So, and then there's a context to that. 
If you're not married to that woman, it's good not to touch her. She's not yours. You're not married to her. She's not your wife. You don't own her. It's not blessed by God. That's what it means. God is warning against sexual immorality. If it's your wife, you touch her, and more than that, you touch her a lot, as he goes on in the passage to say. You touch her continually, and she, you, vice versa, husband and wife. So there's an example of just bad translation. So that's why the languages are so important. Before you get to interpretation, you've got to get the right translation. And there is no perfect English translation, whether it's New American Standard, ESV, CSB, NIV, and on and on they go. The King James Version, the New King James Version, they all have their limitations. So the more we can go back to the original language and get the right translation first, the better. That's going to help us in our hermeneutics. Number three, use one hermeneutic. And I would propose the legitimate hermeneutic is called the grammatical historical approach. Somebody wrote that down, grammatical historical. The emphasis is on grammar of the words, the eight parts of speech, getting those down. But beyond the words, the syntax, how words and sentences and paragraphs relate to each other. Conjunctions and those kind of things, particles, how they relate, very important. The grammar in its essential, most basic meaning. Uh, and then the history, the history of the context, the history of the situation. This is a historical document. Genesis 1 through, just the whole book of Genesis is historical. It's true history. The Bible's true history. Paul was a real guy. Noah was a real guy. Jonah was a real guy. Jesus assumed that they were all real. Historical, the true history. So that's the, pr the approach we take, an objective, grammatical, historical approach. There are alternatives to that. The, one of the main alternatives to that is some kind of allegorical approach. Some embrace a grammatical, historical, and at times allegorical, they call it. They'll call it grammatical, historical, theological. Theological is key for places where I don't want to take something literally, usually eschatology or prophecy. Or some great men of God like R.C. Sproul, J. Adams, all those Presbyterian guys, great theologians. They had kind of a grammatical, historical, theological approach. That's not good because they believed in baptizing babies. And they would admit that's actually not in the Bible, but I'm going to massage the Bible until I find it. And they do. And they do that through their hermeneutic that they're not consistent with. Number four, read the Bible literally. Uh, Luke 17, 32 is an example of Jesus reading the Bible literally. I could have given you more examples. Read the, read the Bible literally. Uh, Jesus did that all the time when he taught. Moses said, Jonah, yeah, remember Lot's wife. Jesus, just out of nowhere, says, remember Lot's wife? He is assuming that she was a true historical person. He's reading Genesis literally. Not so from the beginning, he said in Mark 10 and Matthew 19, as he's referring to a literal Genesis 1 and 2. So we take the Bible literally because that's how Jesus did. That's how the prophets did. That's how the apostles did. That's just the normal way of reading language. If you don't like the word literal, you can put uh, as a synonym normal. Read the Bible normally like you would any other literature. Take it at face value, like you read the newspaper. And with your hermeneutic, you allow for metaphors and those kind of things in symbolic language. Number five, be objective, or as objective as you can be. Acts 17, 11, the Bereans, great Bible students, right? They examined the, the Scriptures carefully. They welcomed the Word of God. They examined the Scripture carefully, listening to Paul, comparing what he said to Scripture, to see if these things be true. They were being objective, and we can be objective, even though today in our world, our post Kantian world, our post-Renaissance world, uh, philosophy and secular humanism wants to tell us with respect to our theory of knowledge or epistemology, we can't be totally objective. Yeah, we can. Because God is objective. God made us objective. God made us in His image. He gave us the capacity to be objective with His help so we can be objective in our Bible study. Uh, number six, do not go beyond Scripture. Do not go beyond what is written. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, do not go beyond what is written in Scripture. In other words, don't read between the lines and come up with your own theology. Don't speculate. Be silent where Scripture is silent. Speak where Scripture speaks. You're studying a passage, you interpret it, you preach it, and then somebody raises his hand, well, what does this mean? What does this say? Well, it didn't say. We don't know. God didn't tell us. Some people, they can't handle that. They've got to know everything, even the stuff that God hasn't revealed. That's dangerous. So... Don't go beyond what is written. Let's just stick with Scripture. Don't speculate. Number seven. I put an asterisk because this is probably the most important or an emphatic point. What determines meaning is the question. What determines meaning, meaning when you're studying the Bible? Today in 
scholarly evangelical circles, probably the number one answer for the last 25 years that we are being told of what determines meaning in the Bible is genre, they say. You need to know the genre of the book of the Bible before you can understand its meaning. So, if you're reading Proverbs before you can get any meaning, you need to understand that it is poetry. Otherwise, you can't understand it properly. Or Genesis 1 through 11. You need to understand that that is poetry, not history, so that you can understand it properly. Well, that's not true. Genre does not determine meaning. What determines meaning? I heard it. Context. That's the answer. Context. The immediate context? Then the context within the book? Then the context within the range of that author? You take all of maybe Paul's 13 epistles together. How does he typically talk, teach, and use vocabulary? Then the context of the New Testament. So these are concentric circles, and you go out from there. The context of the whole New Testament, and then the context of the entire Bible, the whole counsel of God, because God is consistent with himself. Truth doesn't change. So context determines meaning. I put not contextualization because people get confused by that. Contextualization, don't have time to go into it, but do you think contextualization is a good thing or a bad thing? Answer, bad. When it comes to Bible, Bible interpretation, missions, all that stuff, in its original meaning, contextualization is actually a bad thing. And they try to use it in hermeneutics. Basically what contextualization means is that you determine the meaning of the Bible based on either what I think, what I feel, or what's going on in the world today. In other words, truth changes, doctrine changes, the Bible changes. You're disregarding the intent of the original author and what Paul meant. So when I'm studying Paul, I only care about what Paul thought and what Paul meant and what his audience understood. I don't care what's going on in the world today in my life, at my house, at my church, in my country. That has nothing to do with it. That's contextualization. That is <laughs> bad. Number eight, be aware of progressive revelation. Uh, God didn't give us everything we needed to know all at the same time. So he's building. It's incremental. It builds on itself. It's growing. There's this massive literature that's growing. Uh, some things do change. Truth doesn't change, but some things do change in the Bible, right? Circumstances change. The way God deals with his people changes. We don't practice the law anymore. That's a change. We don't do the law the way Moses did. So there are changes. Progressive revelation. More and more revelation God gives. And so you've got to be aware of that. So like Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. He said that at the end of his life. Well, that was progressive. That was new information, progressive revelation. I will build my church. Wait a minute. Up to that point for three years, Jesus never talked about the church. He didn't mention the church. He never said ecclesia to his disciples that we know of in Scripture. They must have been thinking, wait, what? What are you talking about? So then he had to explain it, and then he was going to give it to the apostles to explain the full meaning of what the church was. That was progressive revelation. In other words, the church is not in the Old Testament. It wasn't there in their worldview or their frame of mind. It actually was new information. Number nine, seek the author's intent, the original author's intent and the original understanding of the audience. Matthew 19, 8, Jesus did that very thing. You don't understand what Moses intended. Moses wrote this long ago in 1400 B.C., said Jesus about Exodus through Deuteronomy, because Moses was thinking this, and his audience was thinking this about divorce. Here's what Moses meant. The author's original intent. That's what you're going after. Not your opinion. Number 10, there's only one meaning. One interpretation, many applications in any given passage. One interpretation, many applications. Number 11, theology comes after exegesis, not before. So, say I'm a dispensationalist. I don't take my dispensational theology, that this is this massive understanding of Scripture, and put my dispensational glasses on and then try to interpret the Bible filtered through my dispensational understanding and theology. Don't do that. That's not objective. That's biased. Or my covenantal theology. Or my infant baptism theology. Those are illegitimate presuppositions. We don't study theology, we study theology after exegesis, not before. Your theology is a result of your exegesis. Number 12, and we're going to see this as we go. Use the analogy of faith after exegesis, not during. What's the analogy of faith? A long-standing principle, mostly from the time of the Reformation. It's a good one, the analogy of, the, of faith. Uh, a definition might be that uh, there's a presupposition or understanding that there's just a constant 
theme of main doctrinal truths all throughout and replete through the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. God is consistent with Himself. What He said about sinful man in Genesis is still true in Revelation. What He said about His character in uh, the first book of the Bible is true all throughout the Bible. So uh, doctrine and truth doesn't change. And the analogy of faith is when you, you're reading something and you compare that truth or teaching with another truth somewhere in Scripture. Another, taking parallel passages maybe, cross-references that are legitimate. So these are uh, the ideas of the analogy of faith. We'll talk more about that as well. But we don't use the analogy of faith in our exegesis. It's not, it shouldn't be a part of our hermeneutics. We do our hermeneutics. We, we do our exegesis. We come up with an interpretation we think is accurate. Then when we are done... We use the analogy of faith and compare it with other scriptures. Okay, here's what I've concluded about this passage. Does this conflict with basic obvious truths in any other book of the Bible? If it does, Houston, we have a problem. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I'm understanding it the wrong way. So we'll talk more about the analogy of faith. So with that, I told you we were going to whip through it. Does anybody have any questions about our principles of hermeneutics as we kick off our series? Chi Lam, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the rules of interpretation are not in the Bible. And I would argue that on my 12 rules of interpretation, most of my rules have a Bible passage to go by because a precedent has been set. A couple of those come from Jesus himself, the greatest rabbi, the master teacher. Nobody knows the Bible better than Jesus. He was the best interpreter, preacher, homiletician. He had a hermeneutic. He was consistent with his hermeneutic. He was perfect, but he did establish a pattern. He trained his apostles how to teach, right? Trained the 70 how to teach. He told the apostles to teach others to teach and to do this in perpetuity. So Jesus did lay down, I think, an objective standard that can be deduced from Scripture. And there are even very clear examples of how he did it. His approach was literal. Good question. Question, one more back there. Is that Jesse? Yes. Okay, uh, can I clarify more about the role of genre? Yeah, like, just, like for instance, Genesis 1 did not go to the sea, therefore we know it's not the case of historical. And aren't there other things like poetry? Like, how do we. Figures you would answer, ask a very complicated question, Jesse, <laughs> that requires a 25 minute answer. Um, genre. Well, genre doesn't determine meaning. So even if something is poetry, just because something is poetry, does that mean it's not literal? Is there literal truth in poetry? Yes. Roses are red, violets are blue. Dear Debbie Honeybun, I love you. That, thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, that's, that's figurative. He doesn't mean it. No, yeah, I do. Somewhere at bottom, there is a literal truth being communicated, even in poetry. So that's my short answer. I'll give you a, a 500-page book to read on it, Jesse. You'll love it. Okay, with that, thanks for being here. Next week, so I listed a bunch of topics we're going to do. I don't know if I'm going to do those in order. Uh, I was trying to do them historically. Uh, the system of allegory, Augustine, and again... It's not going to be theoretical. Hopefully it's going to be practical, relevant. It will make a difference in your thinking, in your own life, and in your own evaluation of your own hermeneutics so that in 13 weeks when I ask you, what's your hermeneutic? Boom! You're going to have an answer. It's going to be definitive. You're going to be confident in it, and it is going to be the right answer. That is my goal. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to study the Scriptures together. We thank you for every person that you brought here today. And God, we do thank you for the Holy Spirit who is our greatest teacher as believers. We want to continue to depend upon his guidance. Uh, we thank you for that blessed gift. We pray that we do all these things for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. God bless.